Hey everyone, welcome back to the Beat Your Jeans podcast. This is episode number 328. And we're on YouTube now, as you can see. So if you happen to be listening to this on one of our audio platforms, make sure to check out the Beat Your Jeans YouTube channel. Uh, we've got some content coming out that's going to be really cool. In today's show, we discuss a listener who's frustrated with his current financial situation as an economics major, as well as another listener who is trying to increase their daughter's confidence. So let's see what Dr. Lyle has to say about all this. We'll see you in the video. All right, Dr. Lyle, so what's new? Ah, <clears throat> all's well. Jen's missing a day. She's missing an action. She'll be back in a couple of weeks. The, uh, I'm not sure what's new other than I, we got good weather here. We got 75 degrees and sunny in Sacramento. So that's not too bad. Can't complain. It's about the same here in Southern California. Good, good. All right. Yeah. Well, anybody listening elsewhere, the uh, ho hope things are going well for you too, but we're, we're in good shape here. We're out of the woods. Yeah. Well, you know who's not out of the woods are a few of our listeners that have some questions. So <laughs> sure, yeah. All right. So our first questions actually, uh, our first question is as follows: Dear Doctor Lyle, I'm a 29 year old economics major, and I'm frustrated because I see friends who have gone into investment banking, big law, or medicine on track to make five to ten times my yearly salary. Mm -hmm. I'm making a decent living on sixty thousand dollars a year. But I feel like an idiot for choosing my major, and now it kind of feels too late to change. Hmm. What would you have to say for someone in my position? It feels like maybe I squandered an opportunity, and I know life is not just about making money, but it is a hard thing to ignore. Yes, 29-year-old uh, econ major, I'm not sure what that means. So uh, th that sounds like someone who many years ago got a degree an undergraduate degree in economics. And uh, and now we are probably seven years past that degree. So they're, they've gone out into the world and if they're making $60,000 a year, they are making an okay living. But the thing is, is that they're seeing that, I forget what it is that they said, investment banking and- and uh, Law and medicine. Mm -hmm. Law and medicine. Okay, well, let's, let's these those are three extremely different things. So uh, medicine is not something that anybody can, you know, basically hopscotch their way into medicine. That, that begins with, you know, reasonably in high school, it begins by taking chemistry and physics and biology in high school so that you can compete at the undergraduate level. So you can have an outstanding undergraduate record so that you can get into med school, so that you can do four years of med school, so that then after that you can do residency. I mean, this is a lifetime my massive commitment uh, to being a medical doctor. So that is that is the only way to be into, into medicine, but the um, but that is the, the big fancy, i.e. those are the people that are going to be making 10 times what you're making. Um, now, the uh, law is something entirely different. So law is something you can hopscotch into very easily. If you have an undergraduate degree in economics, you're three years away from having a law degree. So the, uh, at that point, you can you can essentially do what what a fair number of people in the law do, which is to follow your nose to the money, figure out you know where it is that you want to work and what kind of law that you want to pursue, uh, and what kind of sort of uh, na native intelligence and talent you have for a specific area. So there's lawyers that do all kinds of different things. The law is extremely varied in the kind of problems that they solve. Some of them are very contentious. If you if you want to argue and be in under highly emotional circumstances, you do family law for God's sakes. Okay. If you want to uh, not be in highly contentious circumstances, but you you're cerebral, smart, econ major. We don't know what this is, but this could be someone who an econ major is no small thing. That's a difficult major. Um, and depend upon where you go to school and where you went to school and what your what your mind. Uh, looks like in terms of its preciseness. There's all kinds of things that you could do in the law that are lucrative, the uh, that are that have to do with you know some pretty complicated problem solving. So there's that. So I've got people I know that are in patent law and intellectual properties patent law. In other words, these are high, highly cerebral, non-contentious. In other words, yeah, there may be arguments, but they're these are all 
everybody's calm. Nobody's screaming at each other. You know what I mean? Nobody's probably even going to court. These are these are technical details of what is fair, what is the law, where it's been violated, how can we protect ourselves? These are very interesting strategic issues looking at a very complicated board game of of American commerce. So the um so that but that's entirely different than medicine. That that involves a vastly uh less uh commitment and and uh educational process than medicine. So the uh doesn't mean you need to be any less smart, but it's just a different it's just a different animal. Uh you're not doling out pills, you're doling out advice. The uh all right. <laughs> I don't, just came just came out of my mouth. Like that. <laughs> All There's right, no censorship yeah. here, Doctor Lyle. Nah. <laughs> Say whatever you want. So, yeah. now, what was it? Then? The investment banking. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not sure why it is that this person couldn't be involved in investment banking with an undergrad econ degree. You might not have come from a stellar institution with a stellar record, and that some somebody in investment banking, you know, may, maybe you could have done such a thing. But you maybe there's requisite degrees in there to even look like you're real. Maybe you have to have an MBA. I don't know. The um, the maybe you have to have a degree in finance. I don't know. In other words, I'm not sure what would be keeping you out of that arena of the marketplace. Um, that that may be something like I'm not sure what this person is doing to earn their sixty thousand dollars a year. Sixty thousand dollars a year is not nothing, but in the modern world, I mean, we have to calculate that out. That's that's thirty dollars an hour, and people that are in, in California, minimum wage is fifteen. Other places, it's probably ten. So it's skilled labor, but it's not highly skilled uh, for a person that uh, ha had the IQ to go through and and finish an econ degree. So that seems like you are um, on a bell curve, but we we would expect somebody uh, with those kind of chops to to be able to do it in the world. You're not necessarily behind at 29 years old, but we should be we should be in some kind of a situation where we would expect some upside from here. And if we can't see it, then that's a little could be a little disturbing. Uh, if that the, the difference in the money that you would make at sixty thousand versus one hundred thousand or one hundred fifty thousand, if those differences would have very significant meaning for your life, which they would for a lot of people, then you know most people are. You know, uh, the the life of an animal is about using its time and energy in the acquisition of resources. That's what it is. OK, money is one of the chief resources that it is that we seek. It's not the only resource that we seek, but it's a it's a huge player in the game of people's lives. So it would be absurd to ignore those and it would be absurd to ignore that it is not actually the chief resource that people are going to spend most of their time and energy seeking. So therefore, to do it inefficiently relative to what your talents or abilities would be is suspect. In other words, there better be an awfully good reason. There better be other resources that are associated with this process that compensate for the fact that the marketplace would pay you more if you were to do something different with your time. So the, uh, and there are people that are happy that are very bright people and spiritual people and they do massages for a living and they've got the brains to do something else. They could have gone on and been a nurse practitioner. They had the brains, but they didn't want to do it. Uh, most likely they're, they're female and therefore they don't need to get the resources to be a, a cheap breadwinner in a pair bond plus child kind of a situation. But um, yeah, so a, a big question would be, is this a man or a woman who's asking this question? And the uh, that that can have profound implications for, you know, the, the competitiveness of the individual, how much drive they have, what it is that they're aiming at and whether or not the path they're on now is a reasonable pathway to, to get to what would be a reasonable expectation. The. Um, yeah, anyway, that that's a long story, but but I would say that if you're uh, what uh, to, to speak more broadly and to use this as an educational question. The, what will cause human distress is the discrepancy between what it is that we think we should be getting from the world versus what it is that we are getting from the world. 
that or what we think we could be getting from the world and what it is that we are getting from the world. It's the discrepancy between what we believe our potential is, whether we have to go earn that potential or whether or not the potential is sitting unrealized and we're not sure, you know, we're not doing anything about it. In other words, it's the discrepancy between our potential and what we're actualizing. And so that, you know, if we're in a good romantic relationship and we're happy and everything is good, then there's not a discrepancy between what we think we ought to have and what it is that we have. If we have a good job, there's no discrepancy. Uh, if that job feels like it's appropriate to our talent, our effort and our, um, and our skill, et cetera, and our, and the competitive marketplace conditions. In other words, you know, making $2 an hour in one country right now, being a medical doctor would be fair. There's some place on earth where that is actually a very good living. And that person is doing the very best they can to acquire resources under those circumstances. So the, so we we're straight up about this. The truth is, is that the job of your brain is to direct your behavior to the acquisition of resources and, and the, the essentially most valuable processes that you can, that you can uh, string together. That's going to mean the, the, the most satisfying mates, the most satisfying food, the most satisfying kinds of experiences and, and money is an intermediary resource that essentially works similar to esteem that is also an inter intermediary resource. It's an intermediary resource that attaches itself to all other kinds of resources, makes it possible to actually calculate the relative value of different courses of action. So uh, that's an ingenious invention of humans that, that no other animal has. They can only calculate gene survival units uh, and then they don't trade, okay? So they're doing the same thing. Uh, but in a different, with a different method, we have added the ability to actually exchange goods, services, time, energy, uh, and, and other resources that we have, and to actually discover how to optimally get the most that we can out of the marketplace by the use of a price structure. And so this is a, um, fantastical way that human beings can optimize their ability to, uh, trade cooperatively with each other, cooperatively with each other, and get as much as they can out of the available uh, process. So, yeah, yeah, this person has distress inside of their nervous system because they are looking at people that they thought were reasonable competitors. So those reasonable competitors are now on track to earn many multiples of times potentially. It's not like every investment banker kid winds up making $400,000 a year. That's not true. Uh, and it's not true that every lawyer winds up making $200,000 a year. That is not true. But they, uh, we would reasonably expect that people with talent in e any of those areas would make a lot more than $60,000 a year. And so if this, you know, this person's looking at their trajectory and at 29 years old, it's starting to bother them. Fine, it should. Your nervous system is doing precisely what it should be doing. It's looking at your competitive standing and it's saying, I don't think that you are getting the best use of your time and energy and employment. Um, you know, is it how satisfying is it to do what you're doing? If it's immensely satisfying and you are have no problem with other resource uh, problems, then we would, of course, stay and, quote, be happy. But that's apparently not the case. And so it's like, OK, if it's a grind and there's conflicts of interest between me and other people and and I'm not that crazy about what it is that I do, it doesn't feel that meaningful, but it's OK, blah, blah. And I'm making 60,000, but somebody with my same IQ and, and essentially the same educational process, pretty close, i.e. opening up books, listening to lectures, taking notes and taking exams. OK, the people that do that no better than I do it are now making 150. Oh, well, then that should put alarm bells off in your head. And so, you know, let's, you know, if you need to, talk, I'll tell you, you can talk to somebody that knows, Dr. Jen Hawk, who get has a spectacular PhD uh, from the top university in the world, looked at that situation and said, hmm, I don't want to do what I'm supposed to be doing with that degree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, you know, but it was sort of close enough credential wise that, that, you know, she could become a life coach and she's very good at it. And 
if you want to talk to somebody that would be potentially useful at thinking through those kinds of angles or those kind, kinds of questions, that's a good person to call. All right. Uh, so Dr. Lyle, I, I'm, I can imagine uh, what actually happens in this young person's mind when they're going into college. Can you talk mm -hmm. about some of the motivations that one kid would pick you know, the, I mean, I guess, let me back up. Are they seeing yeah, money? Yeah. Is that why the investment banking friend is going into investment banking? Are they having some help from parents saying, Hey, wait a second, you know, you might go into econ, but you're just not, I mean, can you talk through some of those angles of, of what gets the kid to do the economics major versus something else risking their, you know, less happiness right now and frustration? Yeah. I think that um, there could be all kinds of influences. In other words, uh, this is not exactly how you're designed if you're you're a Bushman of the Kalahari. In other words, you don't have a situation where you're doing a long-term investment aiming at some unknown uh, employment process future and then trying to analyze the best deal for your life, all things considered, you know, in the next 50 years. I mean, this is a, we can expect that such a process will be fraught with error okay we will and so we, we can expect that that people will will wind up abandoning careers uh, because the whole thing doesn't feel right to them or it's not the best thing for them for any number of reasons we'll find out that that people often do that you know, they often you know, they don't just change jobs they literally change you know entirely what it is that they're doing you're talking now, to an electrical so engineer we'll be, Turned chiropractor. You're talking. I'm talking to an electrical <laughs> engineer that, that, yeah. that then went and got a doctor in chiropractic, and and so in other words, you're you're looking at um, this is it. It's an awful lot to ask of an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old human to you know. I, I guess you're allowed to not know what you're doing until you, your junior year. So I guess that means 20. It's like, man, I don't know if anybody's talked to any 20 year olds lately. But a 20-year-old is a very naive creature in this world. Uh, they know a lot. They're, you know, a smart 20-year-old is pretty, pretty sharp little cookie. They can they can learn very, very quickly, uh, depending upon what Q and native talents are. But they don't know very much. They know almost nothing about an awful lot of things. And so for them to be trying to look through the adult world of huge investments of career processes and trying to pick something that actually fits them well, that's asking a great deal of that individual. And we're gonna expect that that's not gonna go well an awful lot of the time. So the, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan. My, my mom used to say something and and I actually would have to agree with her that, that you know, nobody should be going to college for at least four or five years. It should be open season. Just go out there and work in a hamburger stand, try to sell insurance, you know, work in a dentist's office behind the computer, making appointments, you know, go, go try to work as a construction person. It's like, just go out there and live a while, okay? And bang out in the universe and then find out all kinds of things about what looks interesting, exciting, et cetera. Now, I mean, that's just, that was just my mom talking. Uh, I'd be just open season, like, forget it. You're not even allowed to be in school. The, uh, that's not even crazy. So if I had a kid uh, that was 18 years old and was a typical, essentially uh, lost freshman, I would probably say, hey, certainly a gap year, maybe three. It's like, no rush. Okay, so the, um, anyway, but that's I'm, neither here nor there. Yeah, I'm smirking because uh, I remember one of the first stories I heard about you as a psychologist, Dr. Lyle, I was working at True North and a friend of mine was there kind of uh, just working uh, with Dr. Goldhammer and yeah. she had seen you because she was, you know, a young, young 20 something year old girl who wasn't quite sure where she fit in the world. And, and I remember she told me that she saw you and you told her, this is, this is the time to be completely and totally reckless and have a good time yes. and learn, learn about yourself. And, and I, I, my parents actually said the opposite when we were growing up, they were like, don't take a gap year. Don't take a couple of years. For them, it was like, you got to finish these things, get life started as quickly as possible. I mean, this was, they're coming from the Soviet Union where, you know, workers yes. have to work as quickly as possible, but, but it was right. really interesting. And I remember kind of thinking like, hmm, 
is psychologist really say that to a young woman? Right. <laughs> it was oh, really, yeah. really and interesting. More. Like mm-hmm. go spend a year on a, on organic farm in Australia, for God's sakes. In other words, a- absolutely. The last thing you want to do is quote, get life started and get into that cubicle as fast as you can. It's like, that's, that's insane. Okay. So particularly if you're not sure that you want to be there. So obviously, you know, be, but now this person has done things the way a lot of us would wind up doing. In other words, you start one down one direction and you actually jump through some hoops, which they did four years worth of hoops to get an undergraduate degree in econ. The, um, and now now we're looking at the situation seven years later and it's like not happy it's like okay that's okay you're with respect to the law you have not misinvested anything you you absolutely you needed a four-year undergraduate degree in order to go to law school so that's you did the big prerequisite for law which is a little bit of a joke but you know it's like why is there a prerequisite for law what on earth am i going to learn in an art history degree from swarthmore it's going to help me to be a better lawyer Okay. Money Actually, laundering towards country, the professors is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it, anyway, it's uh, the the point of it all is is that you haven't wasted your time and you haven't wasted the last seven years working, because if all you did was find out, hey, that's not what I want to do. That's not how I want to be compensated. Good that you needed to learn that, and so you you pointed yourself in the best direction you could. Maybe you had a kindly econ prof that said, boy, the, the way of the world is just really understand economic process. And there's nothing as useful, as useful to the mind as that. Who cares what they pay you? And you, 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 bought, you bought that argument for a while, and now you're not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Be happy. It doesn't matter what you earn. Well, it turns out that uh, I believe the number one correlation coefficient for how happy people are in their work is how well they're paid. Okay. So uh, that, and, and I believe the, the, the uh, possibly the number one identifiable correlation coefficient of people's happiness in general is how well off, you know, what their income is. Very interesting research on that that is subtle about, you know, I remember reading the thing that uh, money really does buy happiness. It's like, well, that's a little more complicated than that because, they didn't say net worth, they said income. That's how they they have they have done that research. And the second thing is, is that they they are assuming it's the money and not the esteem. Mm-hmm. Huge difference. In other words, so if you if you believe you are very well compensated, um p- people that are making salaries of three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. And they are not out of work. So when they do the little survey and they say, well, how much do you make? And it's like, click $350,000 a year. Who are those people? Um, If they're a medical doctor, they're all bent out of shape and unhappy. It's like, I should be making more. My colleagues are making twice as much. Mm -hmm. And what (laughs) they're doing, they're saving lives, at least the emergency doctors. Yeah. Right. So, but the point is, is that most, most people in any kind of a position that are making very large dollars are getting evidence that they are highly valuable. Okay, that's so. In other words, they're by by the nature of the game, those people will be typically out earning what they anticipated when they started. Why would they have anticipated that they would be highly compensated? You know, relative to maybe to their peers. So, in other words, so you're you're if we start talking about high income people, we're talking about some people who. Life has been pretty grand on this dimension. People have given them a lot of good feedback. And so uh, as, as a result, we can't separate. And the feedback has come in a form that is unmistakable and isn't flattery. Somebody who's writing a big check. Okay, So therefore, this is, this is you know indisputable evidence that the world finds me valuable. Unless you're some sleazeball who's got some racket and you're rating Medicare and make it a bunch of money doing that in some fashion. I'm not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody that that's working in you know his cubicle is a bigger cubicle, and he's making very big dollars, and that's evidence that he's very valuable. Okay, so this is the problem with that research. It's not the money, and, and it's not just the resources. It's not the ability to lay on the beach in Hawaii. It's like that's not what it is. It's actually an amalgam of 
the uh, uh, the resources themselves and the esteem signals that come with those resources. Those are you. If you're an over, I can tell you, I've had people that were overcompensated and very very anxious. Okay, they were anxious and paranoid that they were going to be fired, they were going to be let go, their business was going to fail. In other words, they they were making a lot of money, but they were not happy. Why? Because they felt like it was built on sand. Okay, so so it's not it's not like oh no we can just write everybody a big check and then everybody's going to be happy. No, there's a there's something that's going along with this that's essential, uh, which is the esteem signal that's taking place and the esteem signal for it to be uh, satisfying for the organism. It needs to they, they have to believe that it's authentic. Okay, so there's a lot of little wheels within the wheels of this particular Swiss watch, but for our individual that wrote to us. This is a great question, and it's like, okay, you are getting a signal from your nervous system that says you, you know, have not uh, ad addressed the competitive problem well. You're sitting at the 18th percentile relative to what it is that you should reasonably expect for probably this level of talent. That means you've got some competitive actions that need to take place, okay? You don't necessarily need to do any more schooling. You may need to change from working, you know, as a file entry clerk for DuPont somewhere that they just used your brains because you were pretty smart and they have you do some spreadsheets, et cetera. You may need to go from there to the mercantile exchange in Chicago and, you know, start at $50,000 as a little runner on the trade floor and then see what happens in the next two or three years. Okay. So I don't know uh, what necessarily you need to talk to a headhunter. Maybe if you've got any, knowledge or abilities, et cetera. So the point is, is that that you are not a tree and your your mind doesn't stop acquiring information when you, you take your last final. So you can get more knowledge and therefore more ability and also uh, put yourself in a position for to be able to find market opportunities that are going to be more lucrative. That may absolutely be an important, you know, move on the chessboard of your life to make your life better. All right. Thank Good you, Dr. Lau. Yeah. And I want to go back um, right. kind of in the middle of an example, not about this question in particular, but when we were talking about the um, the the girl that you were advising and saying kind of, it's good to go out there yeah. and kind of learn who you are and work on a, the woof, woofing on an organic, you know, work on an organic farm yeah. and things like that. Um, so I was having a discussion with, uh, with, with somebody I know very closely, and we were having a philosophical discussion about this exact topic, which is that, you know, <clears throat> whether it's male or female, it's like at 20, you know, around the twenties is kind of where you're supposed to figure things out. And the, the kind of sticking point where we were disagreeing was the, the other person was saying, well, what happens with the girl's psychology if she goes out and she gets, maybe she gets taken advantage of not, not in a violent sense, but in terms of, um, she has, she has some casual dating encounters that don't feel, feel particularly good for her. And she, she goes through some things. Does that do anything to her psychology about making her more suspicious, more cautious, not as happy? Tell me, talk to me about, about those concerns. Um, and let me just back up. The reason I'm asking is because, um, we have quite a bit of an audience, uh, for the, I mean, this is an evolutionary psychology podcast, but most of the other evolutionary psychology podcasts, they have a very high male dominated audience. Whereas ours actually is about 50, 50. Mm -hmm. We have, we have a lot more women. And so, um, what I hear in the other evolutionary psychology podcast is that if a woman, for example, stays a virgin at marriage, uh, before marriage, then she's vastly more likely to be happy. They st cite some of these kind of poor statistics, uh, indicating these kinds of things. And so it's all, you know, based on trying to please these, this male audience that probably are very similar to the priest we talked about a couple of shows ago, who gets really irritated, you know, if the girl's, you know, giving him, uh, what's it cues that he's that, that she's wandering around, but I know it's a long winded question, but, but yeah. tell me your thoughts about this and wh what do you say? Uh, okay. So let me see if I, let me make sure I understand what you're asking. Yeah. So on this is a parallel issue relative to careers. So it's a, it's a parallel type of thing. In other words, somebody might say, um, so a young girl ought to, you know, settle down, get life started, you know, basically be virginal, find right. something. Pop out the kids, yeah. Start popping out the kids, et cetera, as opposed to go out in the world and, and, and get some brain damage in a bunch of relationships. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
the uh the well, when second, you put it that way dr lyle yeah <laughs> the second path is um generally speaking far superior and and that's because again the the 20 year old doesn't know very much about life personalities they don't know um uh a great deal about about how how these things all work and so as a result uh there there are uh people there, there are certainly women in there's and this is going to be a bell curve as to sort of how how open they are to experience and how essentially easy they are to please and just just how pair bond dominant and non-open that system is and they're you know there are women today by not by cultural brainwashing, but by genetic design that by 19, 20, 21 years old, they found their guy. You know what I mean? And they're going to they're going to like do this and they, nobody's going to talk them out of it. This is they have no interest in any other thing. Nobody else is turning their head. They can they can giggle at, you know, a movie star or uh, some some fancy guy's sexuality but they don't really care and so the the openness level is is such that you're, you're looking at you know parabon dominant creature uh very dominant and so that happens and uh and that and those people i'm not going to talk them out of that and say oh no that's a mistake you're making a mistake the um however Whenever I run into that, I'm always kind of curious, like, hmm, are there other players involved? Is this actually something that's emanated out of that individual? Or do we have um, some fairly powerful adults, churches, faith? Uh, do we have somebody really putting their thumb pretty hard on this scale? Okay. Uh, the answer is often yes. Okay. Not always, but the, uh, the answer absolutely at times is yes. At which point I get the creepy feeling that this person's best interests are not being served and they're being essentially, it's the same kind of a feeling about some young girl who's 17, 18, 19 years old and kind of struggling and shy and having a little trouble in the heterosexual arena or whatever and just, you know, starts getting talked into being a nun. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're, if that makes sense to you, it'll make a lot of sense to you when you're 30 why are we doing this now okay so that, that that's a that's a little creepy for me to see that and so when i see um older adult putting their thumb on the scale prescribing for people um you know a, a very conservative approach to anything i'm like well now wait a second what why is that happening there are, are other people's interests being served rather than your own okay the um however that might be possible but in generally speaking King, the average female that I know wandering around this culture has some openness. Okay. And so she's, she's trying to optimize mating process, which means she needs to calibrate herself. Um, she's going to wind up running into the casual mating strategy. That's going to be carefully cloaked by, by males. She's going to have to learn the hard way. Uh, usually the difference between um somebody that looks like they are a pair bond like they're actually a pair bond candidate versus who who really is a pair bond candidate and so this is you know it's like talking to a bunch of used car salesmen about trying to buy yourself a chevy used chevy truck it's like you know you got to look at a bunch of used chevy trucks and they all look a little different and this is what you can afford and what's really the best deal and it can be tough to figure it out and so to try to snap our fingers and figure that out at 19 or 21 years old, you're asking a lot of the fact that you're that the person is not going through a a a reasonable calibration process of explore, exploring what what could be in their best interest in terms of trade. It's like somebody taking the first job out of college, you know what I mean, with the firm across the street and never finding out what their options are. There are people that will stay right there for 50 years and get a gold watch and can, and get their 50 cents an hour increase every three years. And when, when they're done, they're done. That's fine. Okay. And if that's how they're built and that's their level of openness, there's nothing in the world wrong with that. Those people could be quite happy about that. But most people are going to have a curiosity that's going to say, well, now, wait a second. I wonder if they pay better somewhere else.
and not locking yourself down with a marriage and a child at 23. This is like, you know, we, we would want to, similarly to the employment and career situation, maintain an open mind of experimentation and a learning curve where we shake out some of the uncertainty as to what on earth we ought to be doing with our existence. You know, long-term pair bonding processes, uh, I would I would say this about them, them um, that they're not part of human natural design. So human, human beings, you will not see this as a characteristic pattern of human nature in areas where you do not have private property and accumulated wealth. So you will see it in even very primitive uh, agrarian societies where they have cattle, wealth, land, et cetera. And uh, anthropologists looking at this, these problems said, well, yes, this is a deep universal. Even if I take a book off the shelf here by Don Brown, um, I'm probably going to, you know, who a, was a great anthropologist. Uh, I think that he's going to say that marriage is a human universal and he will have been wrong. Okay. Uh, I don't know if he, I don't, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I, he may not say that, but I, I read that book and I don't remember. I think he, 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 he uh, basically spelled out, I don't know, 105 human universals or whatever it was. And I'll, I wouldn't be surprised if that's in there, but certainly people see it that way. And they look hard at this thing and everywhere people look, they feel like this is human universal. It is not a human universal. It's a human universal where there is the unnatural situation of the accumulation of capital. Okay, that is that is not human nature. Human nature evolved with no capital at all. That's how, how human beings evolved. They evolved as bush people. They evolved as um, wandering hunter gatherers that were on a camping trip their whole lives. The, when you introduce capital into that situation, you change entirely the situation. It's like it's like you know having a bunch of you know wild animals around your house, and then you start putting food out. It's like oh well, now you've just changed an awful lot of things. What food did you put out for what animals? You might attract a bunch of animals, and then that that you may put animal uh, food out for you know a vegetarian animal. And then the problem is, is now the prey animals start coming around your house because they're going to be preying on the on the on the uh, uh, vegetarian animals that are there to eat your food. In other words, you've now changed the landscape. Now you can't even walk to your car. You might get attacked by some predator that would otherwise not be anywhere in sight. So when you start changing the landscape uh, of of the, the game, when you literally change it away from its design. You're going to wind up with interesting problems, and the interesting problems that people have wound up with is the idea that hey, we've got to nail down the property and the uh, transmission of property across generations. In order to do this, we have to know where every gene is in this game and who is it is. And so, in order to get not out negotiated in this situation, so that's why we have to have fidelity. Okay, fidelity and marriage. These things are not seen in hunter-gatherer tribes, okay? You have serial monogamy, which is typical, and then you have some chippy behavior, uh, a little cheating on the side. But what you don't see is you don't see catastrophic upheaval around the breakup of Parabon. I mean, you could, but you're not having any face that's launching a thousand ships. I mean, this is not how this is going to go down. And you're not going to have divorce court you know, battling it out o over the money in the child custody. So as a result, the when when things went south in in uh, when when a, a love affair goes south, it goes south, and, and it looks like a love affair going south from a college sophomore. It's like, oh, okay, as it should. A college sophomore is about the age that an awful lot of human reproduction ever took place. So when you start rolling your eyes at the romance as a college sophomore, it's like, hey, that's your ancestry. How old do you think was the average person in your genetic lineage over the last 200,000 years that was your, you know, th that gave birth to you? The answer is most of them were, the average age is probably 21. So 
when we look at that situation, those people didn't meet at 21 and then stay together for 50 years, 60. That never happens. I mean, on occasion, um, undoubtedly it does, but it's not typical. And so what's typical of the species is for people to have a relationship that may last two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, and then have them have those relationships fade. The um, So you can imagine, wait a second, you know, children now are, you know, these are complicated, expensive processes that are, they don't look like Stone Age processes. We go to work, you make money up to buy houses. You didn't have to buy houses in the bush. The, uh, and so you're thinking about your future, all these kinds of opportunities and all these kinds of responsibilities. These are extremely expensive things to do. And so to, to uh, lock yourself in early in a relationship where there's going to be very long-term economic and social consequences, uh, it's like, wait a minute, be careful. There's no, there's no reason to do this. And so um, my, my phrase that I have adopted is you don't get married, you find out if you are. If you get married, okay, good luck to you, as they used to say, you know, good luck, kiss for luck and you're on your way. Let's say, let, let's hope that we, we statistically can get a good guess of what, about what that thing's going to look like in 10 years. And there's going to be a very, very high probability that one or both both parties would would not want to be there. The um, and if they didn't have the financial and social constraints on them, they would not be there. Okay, that's not an indictment that their marriage is a fraud. It's the fact that their behavior is being constrained by by altered cost benefit you know inputs that aren't aren't consistent with the natural history of the species, and then. We shrug our whole shoulders and everybody says, well, that's just what everybody has to do. It's like, well, that isn't what everybody has to do. Okay, so you're, uh, it's, it's what you, you may walk yourself into if you're not careful. So, the, um, so anyway, yeah, my answer to the question of wh what does the young woman do? Well, if you have an extraordinary situation, you meet somebody at 24 years old, you want to have children with them. Then my my attitude would be all right. Let's wait three years. Oh, but we want to get married. No, don't get married. Do not do not get married. Wait, find out if you are married. Let's just see what happens. Okay, let's see what the next three years bring. That would be my attitude, and we'll just find out what that thing honestly looks like three years from now. And we'll find out if somebody isn't making some noises. Like, gee, if I wasn't already committed and I wasn't already getting kind of pushed into this thing. Would I actually want to be here or would I want to be free? Somebody needs to take, talk to a therapist behind closed doors quietly and privately. And let's find out really where your life is at with respect to that. Okay, so anyway, that's how I look at that question. And that's why, you know, open season. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I, I, I wouldn't make this as a blanket prescription, but I would be willing to defend this in a discussion with somebody that would disagree with me. I'm not so sure people ought to be getting married before the age of 30. It's like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Um, think you need to be looking this over from all angles. And uh, and no, oh, I don't know. And even having children that young. Yeah, the these are like I said. Remember, we've got uh, Betty Lou, who is not interested in anything but working at the city library and going home to her. The, the love or light that she met in her junior year of high school. And the two of them are two little, two little pair bonding peas in a pod and they want to get started right. Good for them. But, and they may in fact be holding hands with each other when they're 84 years old. Okay. But they are the exception and they, they are not the shining example of how this is to be done. Okay. So it needs to be done with a great deal of humility about what it is to you're going to learn and how it is that you're going to feel in our new, new circumstances and what in fact will be the best moves for your life and walking into very serious constraints you know what i mean is a something that people should be very cautious of and they should avoid until it's obvious that this is where i want to be and this is obvious that this is what i want to do and the evidence keeps coming in month after month after month after month after month after month without any significant turbulence. Okay.
you show me three years of that, and now we're going to talk about something that, that looks like it has a chance to not be actually an expensive mistake. That's great. All right. Point. Thank you. I haven't quite heard you so, wind out on the emotional ecosystem yeah. uh, like you did as far as perturbing one area will cause you know, a whole bunch of cascade, like the animals coming to the, to the driveway now looking for food. So yes. it's very similar to well, health yes. where, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Nathan. Well, yeah. no, similar. So to health where, where you can't perturb the system and one, like give somebody one medication and turn off a particular symptom and expect there not to be some, something going on on the other side. And so, yeah. yes, very much so. Exactly. So this has been, this has been an, a very interesting alteration in human landscape and has had profound implications for, you know, the way people's lives are structured. Um, and th there's costs and benefits associated with this, obviously. And we'd much rather live in a society with capital than without, when I mean capital, I mean bridges, buildings, offices, cars, houses, swimming pools, tractors, all this. Th these are accumulated wealth of the work that people did before that we now get to, you know, my house was built in 1990. Those guys are long gone. Whoever it is that built that house that they're, they're, they're either, they've either passed away or they are retired or they're doing something, you know, something entirely different, but the house remains. Okay. And I get to live here every day and get the satisfaction and value of it. I'm not a roving hunter gatherer looking for a safe place to sleep and avoid predators. So, Capital is fabulous, but it also alters all kinds of processes. So you may have had occasional tribal warfare over a pretty face, but you don't have catastrophic mayhem like you have seen in, in, in international warfare between, between nations. So there are, it's sort of interesting to look at what the modern changes of landscape have brought. They have brought incredible blessings and they have also brought some some bizarre looking prices that we're not used to looking for and uh, asking a 25 year old that actually has a very legitimate uh, uh, possibility and likelihood of living to 80 to ask that person to make a mating choice and a career choice at 25 years old it's like you're asking a lot and my attitude is everybody needs to you know, do what they can to reduce that pleasure and s slow that roll because you're going to learn a lot through your experiences. It's hard to get off the train if it's already moving. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You got it. All right. What else do we have? All right. Uh, dear Dr. Lyle, my daughter is a good student and a good athlete, but she seems to have low self-esteem. Is there mm -hmm. anything I can help her do to increase her confidence? Well, you know, that's a, uh, that's, that's a good question. So it's hard thing to, to, to answer because probably what's going on is you're looking at a natural derivative of high conscientiousness. So the people differ in how secure they feel in, in the tribe relative to their competitors and relative to what station they seek. So if she's good athlete and she is uh good student and liked by her peers. I, I don't know what her social feedback is, but the objective feedback about her athleticism and her intelligence uh, and her conscientiousness is coming back very formally. We don't necessarily know what the rest of the story looks like. We don't know how, you know, how old was she? Do we know? Does no, it just, just, just uh, doesn't say, say my daughter's yeah. a good student athlete. So I'm assuming high school, but could be college yeah, as yeah. well, maybe even junior high, but. Could be an eight-year-old. Yeah. So we, yeah. we don't really know, okay? So, and we when we say self-esteem, it's useful to understand that that is a vague concept. And probably you don't mean self-esteem in the way that I mean self-esteem. So I actually have a different definition than the rest of the world for a specific purpose. Self-esteem to me is the, the moral judgment that you feel inside yourself about the efforts that you're making. That's a different thing than self-confidence. So self-confidence is a very, very different animal. So you are, you're, I'm hearing probably this person's self-esteem is solid, but, but I, you know, I run into problems talking about these issues because euphemistically self-esteem and self-confidence are interchangeable in our society. 
And yet, as a result, we're missing a very, very important distinction about internal processes if we do that. The, um, the it's self-confidence that you're observing that is low. And it's going to turn out that self-confidence is not a generalized characteristic, it's specific. So a nerdy math major uh, can feel extremely confident about his ability to solve a differential equation, but he is terrified of, uh, of, of asking out the, the nerdy girl next to him in, in his class because he feels like uh, he's he's not cute enough. Okay, so what are we what are we saying about his self confidence? There is no general self confidence. Usually, when we talk about self confidence generally, we are using a much more general statement, and it's usually about sexual self confidence. That's usually where we're talking about it. Okay, not always. There can be people who are very sexually self-confident, but they're but they have very significant gaping confidence in their ability to do commercially competitive things. Okay, um, the uh, they they may be confident in, in an awful lot of ways, but they're they're really not confident in some some specific. But when we look at these things, when we're looking at this young lady, we're looking at confidence, not what I call self-esteem. And we're talking about her, where she feels relative to other people across a variety of things. So does she lack confidence on the soccer field? Does she lack confidence in English class? No, she does not lack confidence in English class or the soccer class, probably. She probably feels insecure with respect to her competitive standing in a specific social domain. So those social domains are heterosexual or sexual domains, if we get more broadly speaking. At, or they are social domains in terms of friendships. So those are going to be the two big classes of competitive processes. And your your girl may feel relatively uncompetitive there in one of those two processes, the um, or both. Okay, that could be there could be a variety of reasons driving that. Two of those reasons are natural genetic variation and how confident people are in those domains. So it's how much anxiety they have which is a derivative of their conscientiousness. So the more con highly conscientious they are, the more they they are analyzing the worst case scenario and fearing it, which will make their behavior conservative, much like a person who checks the the their doors three times at night, and makes sure they're locked before they go to sleep. Okay. That's the same kind of high conscientious individual in social domains is very, very careful about signaling interest in other people and about doing anything that looks like they're attempting to signal interest to other people. In other words, so we're finding someone that may be actually perfectly fine and competitive and is not overblowing their, their hand or have unrealistic expectations. But what they have is extremely high conscientiousness, which is native to them and is driving a, quote, low self-confidence, i.e. what you're calling low self-esteem. That is probably what is happening, okay? And there's probably not a damn thing to be done about it. And so that is a something that that person will go through their life process and be very conservative in these domains and be very, very careful and not doing things to lose esteem in those domains by playing. Essentially, they're the equivalent of a poker player and they are playing very, very carefully. Okay, they're they're making they're trying very, very carefully not to lose. That is what I, is I think that you're seeing. Now, the question is, what could I do to help her? You know, um, you'd have to talk to me or talk to a Jen Hawk who's certainly aware of all of these kinds of things. In other words, that's kind of what we are here to do. That's We're trying to figure those things out for everybody. Like uh, in your situation, is your, is your lack of confidence between, you know, the, the, and you're feeling you're suffering as a result of a lack of feedback that you think that you should be getting or you should be doing something about getting to it. In other words, what's happening there? And uh, there are obstacles that get in the way that, that we've explained. The ego trap can get in the way. The high conscientiousness can get in the way. Those two things can be interacting in a way that can, can make uh, certain competitive processes very uh, noxious uh, for for people to go through at any age, but particularly a young person, uh, as they're trying to feel their way and trying to understand suddenly the game that is 
they can no longer avoid. They are facing sexual competition. You're suddenly, when you're 13, 14 years old, it's like, what happened? This is not about, you know, just being teacher's pet anymore or wh whether you follow the rules well or you're good at kickball. Suddenly there's real stakes involved. You know, it was beautiful when uh, in reading somewhere in the mating mind, I believe, uh, the, uh, the only time I think I read this sentence, uh, it was it, nothing like coming out of a guy like Jeffrey Miller, who said, this is where the action is. This is real live human beings playing for the biggest stakes that there are. You better believe there's a lot of emotion behind this. So, you know, what can you do to help your kid? I'm not sure. I know my my parents recognized a nerd in my sister that that didn't, you know, have a lot of confidence in the Serena, a lot of knowledge about being a girl because my mom's not girly. And they sent her to a little thing for, I don't know, a few months called John Robert Powers, which was like a half half baked little finishing school. And my sister then got to talk to girly girls so that my sister is not, but she got to learn some things. She got to learn a little bit about fashion, a little bit about dress. Uh, et cetera. These are, this was legitimate education for my sister. And it made a difference in her confidence as she went through high school and then went on into, uh, into young adulthood. So, you know, it didn't change her personality. She was still inherently conservative about all these things, but it, it made her feel like she understood the game better and had more tools about how to play and compete more effectively. So there you go. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to hit like, share, and subscribe to our channel as it helps us out a ton. And if you're a new subscriber to our YouTube channel, and maybe you want to listen to some older episodes, you can hear them on any major podcasting platform like iTunes, Spotify, Libsyn, or others. Or just go to beatyourgenes.org. Thanks for watching and see you all next time.